Good morning. So we're uh, we're in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Um, got one more on this, and then I I think I've decided to maybe try to tackle uh, Romans. This lesson, I uh, I don't know, might be a little controversial for some, I guess, but I feel like it's important and I'm going in order and that was the point of this is to kind of force me to do things that I don't want to do. So anyway, let's begin. Um, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And I'll uh, start by reading the whole chapter. Now we request of you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they, may, that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. <clears throat> So last time we were uh, reminded again of how much Paul um, and the others who were with him loved the church at Thessalonica, and Paul tells them that they spoke proudly of them to other churches of God because of their faith and perseverance in the midst of persecution because they were experiencing persecution and still had faith. We talked about how God in his infinite wisdom, he allows suffering and hardship for our spiritual growth and also for his glory. God causes all things to work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Suffering is not just a bad thing that happens to us in life. That's not all it is. It also helps us grow and become stronger, and it gives glory to God. We talked about not repaying evil for evil because God is the ultimate judge, and that's his job. We were reminded of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where no temptation is given to us that is not common to man. And Paul also says there that God will not allow us to go through something that, uh, without also giving us a way out of it. We spoke of the eternal state of hell and how people who go there are forever outside of God's presence. And uh, the absence of God's presence is really hell itself. Remember, God keeps a lot of evil from happening that we don't even know about. And there, he's not there. So, let's begin here in uh, verse 1 of chapter 2 in Second Thessalonians. He says, Now we request of you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, 
that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So apparently there were some Thessalonian believers that had bought into a lie that Jesus had already came back. Um, they thought that it already happened because of this letter that is talked about here that they supposed was from Paul. And, but we, we have people today that teach the same thing, that Jesus has already came back. But here Paul combines the coming of the Lord with our gathering together with him in verse 1. Now for me, this is a pretty big clue about when the rapture takes place. Because in the same thought, in verse 2, he goes on to speak about the day of the Lord, which in Scripture is always referring to the wrath of Jesus at the beginning I mean, at the end of tribulation, when Jesus comes back. And Paul says, to not let anyone mislead you concerning the day of the Lord. He says, to not be quickly shaken. This term, quickly shaken, it's used for an earthquake in Acts 16, 26. It means to not be disturbed or alarmed by it. Paul is describing a state of worry. Don't, don't be anxious about it. Jesus talks about the same thing. But this worry, I guess, in this context, seems like the Thessalonian church had been worried by it and, and anxious with it. They were being misled by this spirit or message or letter that they suppose was from Paul. People are still misled about the times and events that are written for us in the Bible. We have been given the outline of what God has in store for the world, but we tend to get it so wrong and I believe that we're misled because we allow our own wishes and desires to control what we're reading or we read into it what we want because we're selfish humans and we, we don't want trouble and things like that. But we need to allow His Word to speak for itself and stop letting our own thoughts and desires speak into it. But this is also why there's so many different denominations and religions in the world because we want things to be a certain way and because of that we have all these different belief systems that, that we've come up with as humans. And this was also an issue in Thessalonica. Solomon says that there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that has happened will eventually happen again. We repeat the same mistakes that we always have throughout human history. And that's why it was such a big deal when those people were removing all those historical statues in the United States because it, it, it prevents us from remembering. So, <clears throat> of course, those people, they didn't care about that. All they cared about in the moment were their own feelings. Selfishness makes us do stupid things. Uh, verse 3. He says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So he says, let no one in any way deceive you. Paul is telling the Thessalonians to not be deceived no matter how credible the source might be or how credible you think the source is. And this is a lesson for us all to do our own research. And, and the things that we believe. And he says this, uh, he, he says, don't be quickly shaken or deceived. Paul is going to, to line out exactly what has to happen before the day of the Lord can come, before Jesus comes back to take his kingdom for a thousand years. So he says the first thing that has to happen is there's a falling away. The word apostasy is apostasia in Greek. And it means a defection from the truth or forsaking the truth. The best definition is falling away from the truth because Jesus is the truth. So the first thing that's going to happen is this great falling away. And we could argue that this is already taking place. When we look at the world today, there's a very noticeable evil force at work. We all see it. And we have most certainly as a nation fallen away from God even falling away from absolute truth. We see people who don't know whether they're a boy or a girl. We see innocent life taken out of convenience to ourselves. 
people have right and wrong reversed in their minds and actions. The woke co culture is infiltrating our everyday lives, taking over our government officials so much so that they're creating laws and uh, things like that to, to go along with it, just to make people happy and to get Satan's agenda going. Demonic activity is running absolutely wild in, in the world and in our country. So yes, we can argue that the falling away has taken place. But on the other hand, we also have Christianity growing rapidly in, in other places in the world, like China, for instance. We see God moving in the world even in the midst of the unrest. And he still changes lives. Faith still increases in these areas. So the question remains, have we entered into this apostasy that Paul is talking about, this falling away? I don't know that we've quite gotten there yet, or we're at least in the beginning of it if we are there. But in this context, Paul seems to be indicating a specific event, possibly maybe an outspoken, obvious departure from God worldwide, or maybe even just centered around Israel, because we remember that the Bible is centered around Israel. So I don't think the specific event has quite happened yet, but it's definitely close. And I don't know about you, but I believe we can feel it as Christians. I believe that it's going to be a clear and, and obvious falling away, maybe even celebrated worldwide when it happens. I'm still hoping that we have a big revival around the world. We see popular people moving away from this woke agenda that's, that's going on, some of them. People that would normally be on board with it, but the woke agenda has gone so far crazy that they don't want any part of it. And that's, I think that's a good sign. God has the ability to heal our world and give it more grace if he desires. We've had 2,000 years of Jesus' grace already. The Bible tells us that a thousand years is like a day to God and a day is like a thousand years. This means that he's outside of time. It has some other meanings that I won't get into now, but it means that God's outside of time as well. And so to wait for God isn't, isn't a big deal. And Paul, I mean, Peter even says in 2 Peter 3, 9 that God is not slow to keep his promise. He is patient with us because he doesn't want anyone to go astray. He doesn't want anyone to, to be condemned. He wants everyone to come to him. So I'm hopeful, but honestly, it really doesn't seem to be the case in our current predicament. We seem to be falling further into lawlessness, not really getting closer as a whole. Everything seems to be lined up like it never has before, prophetically. Um, and I'm obviously not the only one who who believes this. But throughout history, there have been times when people thought that the end was close, so you never know. But in any case, I, I've said it before, we're, we, we should be ready anyway, no matter what happens. So Paul says that there's going to be this falling away, an apostasy, and then the son of destruction will be revealed, the man of lawlessness. This is the prince who, who is to come, the little horn that Daniel refers to. John calls him the beast in Revelation. This is the Antichrist, the person who will sit on God's throne in Israel and claim himself to be God. An interesting side note here, this phrase, son of destruction or son of perdition, it's the same term that was used of Judas Iscariot. The same spirit that entered Judas is the one who will also enter this man. The Antichrist isn't Satan himself, but he may as well be. And he's being used by him. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Who opposes and exalts himself, talking about the Antichrist, above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So the end time story of the Antichrist is that he's going to start out somewhat small, and insignificant, or at least to us over here. He's going to be um, important, but just kind of another spoke in the wheel in the beginning. This is why Daniel refers to him as a little horn. 
There's going to be ten kings, part of the fourth kingdom, as we'll look at in a second in Daniel, that are in control. These kings are in control of this kingdom at the end of times. So let's, let's look at that. Daniel 7.23. Thus he said, the fourth beast, this is, um, this is the vision that's being interpreted to Daniel. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, which is what I'm talking about here. And he will be different from the previous ones, or I'm sorry, and another will rise after them, talking about the Antichrist, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings out of the ten. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time, just three and a half years. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the, the coming of Jesus after that. So this is, right here, it's kind of referring to the second half of tribulation. And then we also see Revelation 13. We can read about him in there as well. Revelation 13, 1 through 10. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for forty-two months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here's the perseverance in the faith of the saints. So first I want to talk about how it talks about persevering through this time, when he's here. Um, I also want to point out verse 8. He says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written. Which means that if... I'm correct, or people that I have learned under are correct about us going through the tribulation, you will not, you're not going to be caught up by him. You're not going to be deceived by him because your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the Antichrist is going to be part of this kingdom movement. He's going to slowly rise towards the top and starting to be recognized for his political genius. He'll have all the answers. He'll be a smooth talker. He's going to seem like he's accepting of all religions, even to the point that some Christians who call themselves Christians are deceived. He will be loved by just about everyone because of his positions, and he's going to bring everyone together. This is going to take place in a period of three and a half years, which is the first half of this tribulation. That's as his, as his rise goes. Daniel 27 says that he's going to even make a covenant with Israel 
and he's going to break it after three and a half years. And that's the halfway point. The Antichrist will be killed at this time, and he's going to either be killed or to appear to have been killed. I, I believe he's probably going to be really killed. People are going to marvel at his resurrection. They're going to treat him like a god. And at that time, he's going to take full control. He's going to break that covenant that I talked about with Israel. And he's going to implement laws against any form of religion besides his own. Which, as we've looked into a bit before, I believe that's going to be Islam. As, people says, as Paul says here in verse 4 um, of Thessalonians, he's going to exalt himself above all the gods and kingdoms, all objects or people of worship. He himself will become the object of worship and come to expect people to worship him and his image. He's going to take his seat in the temple of God. I believe this is a physical thing and a metaphor. I think he'll literally sit on God's earthly throne that, is, that Israel restores. But he's also going to expect um, to be the object of worship. And I think his religion will be the, the metaphor here. The Antichrist will also accept no other forms of religion to the point of death as the consequence. The revela Revelation even talks about we'll have our heads cut off as Christians. Some people have said that the Antichrist is not a man, but he's more like a, it's more like a system. Um, I think this is kind of true to a certain degree. John does tell us that anyone who is against God is an Antichrist. Um, but the Bible does seem to describe a real person. At the very least, he's going to be in charge of this movement and religion, and he'll be the embodied Islam, so to speak, I think. But he will be a real human. And although we seem to be approaching the end time, I don't believe this person has quite risen to power, or at least he, he's still that little horn that we talked about. If we are as close as it seems we are, it won't be long before these ten kings do come together, and that's something that we should keep our eye on. Um, with the war in Russia and Ukraine, and you've got China and Taiwan, and you've even got conflict in Israel now. With all this stuff um, going on, it definitely seems like we're at the edge of this coming to fruition. The thing to keep your eye on right now, though, is the conflicts in Israel and the rising power of these ten kings that will dominate the surrounding areas of Israel. They're going to have a good relationship or a peaceful one, like I said, for three and a half years. And it's, it's after the Antichrist resurrection that, that things will change. And the Bible says that uh, the final three and a half years will be tribulation and persecution for anyone who doesn't worship him, and it's going to be tribulation such as never been seen before, nor ever will be. And then the day of the Lord will come. The specific, in my opinion, one day event that the Bible talks about. When Jesus comes back to gather his elect, to himself and begin the revelation exodus to exact judgment on the ungodly and the antichrist. So let's move on to verse 5, 2 Thessalonians 5. Paul says, "Do you not remember that while I was still with you I was telling you these things? And do you not know and and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work." He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So Paul says that he's already told them about all of this stuff. And then he says something that is a little bit unclear by scholars. They, they kind of, they're not for sure on it. He says, you know what restrains them. And because he's not specific, there's a bunch of different beliefs in this. John MacArthur lists eight different beliefs. He says, human government, preaching of the gospel, the binding of Satan, the providence of God, the Jewish state, the church, the Holy Spirit, and Michael the Archangel, or Michael the Archangel. But, I mean, I believe it's pretty obvious, and, um, you know, this might be, this might be controversial to some people that don't believe in God's sovereignty, 
at least fully. But the Bible teaches that God is 100% sovereign, which means that he controls everything. He allows certain things to happen through his control, and he holds back certain things. And we talked about that in my last sermon too. But some people believe that God is only omniscient, or at least that's how they act. Omniscient means all-knowing. They believe he knows what will take place and when it will take place, but has no control over this timing. This is false. He is all-knowing, but he is also all-powerful, meaning that he's in control as well, omnipotent. We can't fully understand this because we are part of creation, but the Bible clearly teaches that God is all-powerful as well. We're told that God chooses us before we choose Him, for example. That's why, it has, that's why it's such an amazing grace when we're called, because when, I mean, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have accepted Him if we weren't called. It's, it's full grace. And that's what Paul talks about in Galatians. We have no control over that. There's nothing we can do to gain that grace without Him acting first. The book of Job gives us an example as well. God has asked several times by Satan to tempt Job, to put him through trials, his family and his things and himself. This tells us that God controls that. Satan had to ask him for permission. And we don't like to think about this kind of stuff because if, he's, he, is, if he is in control, the age-old question comes up, why does evil exist? The answer is simple, we just don't want the truth, or don't like the truth. Evil exists because man is evil. We're evil by nature because of the fall of Adam. Although God could intervene and has at times and still does, He chooses not to sometimes for His reasons and His purposes, regardless of what we want or think. His ways are not our ways and His thoughts are not our thoughts. God has his own purposes, and they're much greater than ours. So the answer to who is restraining Satan, in my opinion, is very simple. He's restrained by God because it's not his time yet to be revealed. The Antichrist is restrained because God's timing has not come yet. He'll be revealed when God chooses. The verse is what's holding him back. The answer is God's power because he's in control. God controls Satan. And God has an appointed time for him just like he has an appointed time for us in our lives. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So at God's timing, he's going to remove the strengths, restraints from Satan and the Antichrist, and this is when he'll be revealed. And just as Jesus spoke into existence all things, by the breath of his mouth, he's going to put an end to the Antichrist and his movement and cast him away for a thousand years, where for the reasons we don't understand because Revelation doesn't say it, he'll be released after those thousand years and ultimately sent to the lake of fire at the very end. So he's going to use his words to destroy the Antichrist. The very glory that stopped Paul in his tracks on the road to Damascus going to persecute Christians, is going to stop the Antichrist and his. This lawless one that it talks about is the Antichrist and in his whole movement with the prophet as well. Verse 9 explains it a little further. He's the one who is in accord or joined to the activities of Satan. He will be given the ability of power and signs and false wonders. Verse 10 is interesting. It starts out and says, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. First off, the signs and wonders that the Antichrist will do will easily deceive unbelievers. They're going to follow him because of his signs and wonders without a second thought. 
We can already see a glimpse of this in our society now. We see people just going with the flow of things, and the government says to jump, and they jump. All people follow something or someone, ultimately. You either follow God or you follow your own desires, which are rooted in a belief system. But even your... And that brings us to the next part of the verse. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. God makes us a new person when we're saved. We've talked about that before. We start to become conformed or sanctified to His will and His ways. We follow Him even to death. But because an unbeliever does not accept the truth of Jesus during their opportunities of life, they're going to perish, and they'll be deluded, as the next verse says. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them to the truth, they're blinded and deaf, and they don't have eyes to hear. I mean, <laughs> eyes to see and ears to hear. In verse 11, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, a debased mind, as Romans 1 talks about, so that they will, be, they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. A deluding influence, some translations say a strong delusion, the same idea. If you wonder why it's so hard to reason with certain people, this verse tells you. When people reject God, He gives them up over to this debased mind. They'll end up believing all kinds of crazy non-truths, and they're impossible to reason with because they're rooted in that belief system, and they've been given up. Paul says God sends a divine judgment on them so that their fate is sealed here. So they'll keep on believing what is false, is what Paul is saying. This is a spirit that Paul is talking about. God uses Satan's once again and his fallen spirits or demons for his purposes. They're their purposes too, but they're used for God's purposes. This is specifically speaking about the last days here. It's going to become more and more crazy, if you can believe that. We look at what's happening all around us, and it's, it's already insane, but I see some of the agendas being pushed and think, how in the world can these people believe this kind of stuff? But this is why, because God has sent them this deluding influence, this debased mind, and He's given them up to believe what is false and to let them just continue in the things that are false. We think of this, the newest movement, I guess, this transgender movement, these people can't explain what men and women are. They're deluded in their thinking. They argue about these most basic biological facts. To us, it's obvious, but they're so adamant that they're right. So why does God send this strong delusion to seal their fate and their unbelief? First off, as we've talked about, because they didn't accept Him when they had the opportunities. They turned from Him and blasphemed Him. They desired the world and its pleasures over truth. And the second reason is, Paul says, so that they may be judged. They took pleasure in wickedness instead of God's truth. And just like God has always judged the willful rejection of His truth, so it will be in the last days. He's going to give men over to this debased mind who continually have rejected this truth, and they're left to the consequences of their sin, which is His judgment. Thankfully, we have Christ to cover our sins. Verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain glory, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, throughout the Thessalonian letters, we've seen how Paul makes a point over and over again to call them his brothers, and that says that they're loved or beloved by the Lord. He's giving him, them his seal of confirmation of their salvation, Paul's seal. And once again, he also confirms that salvation is from God. They didn't choose God, he chose them, just like he chooses all of us from the beginning. And once again, Paul also confirms that sal I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this acts as a reminder to the Thessalonians that because they are chosen by God, 
They can't lose their reward. They won't miss the rapture. And they won't lose their salvation. As much as they may struggle and suffer because they were suffering in their time, they are saved. But it's also a reminder for us as well because although we suffer here, we have our salvation stored up for us in the end. Life isn't easy and we aren't promised an easy Christian walk. In fact, we're promised the opposite. But Jesus says that he won't lose any of us no matter what. Paul said that he called them through their gospel. So the question is, what is their gospel? He's talking about him and um, his others that are with him. And it's the gospel that says that Jesus died for the ones he chose from the beginning to cover their sins. The gospel that says that you'll, you'll suffer for God because he suffered for you. You will have trials. We will have troubles. And it's all for his glory and his purposes. But in the end, we'll be saved and we'll gain glory. But primarily, Paul is talking about his specific gospel message that he was given by Jesus to the Gentiles that were grafted in to the Jews. Remember, Paul is writing to Gentiles here mostly in Thessalonians. Verse 15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. The word tradition here where he says stand firm and hold to the tradition, it's really better translated transmission. Paul isn't meaning the tradition of doing things necessarily in a specific way repeatedly. He's talking more about holding on to the words that they've received from them, the transmission of word that they've received from them. Obviously because they had forgotten or misunderstood the teachings that they allowed this letter to mislead them. But it does apply to us too because we also need to stand firm on God's inspired word. We don't need to read into it our own thoughts and desires regardless of whether we like it or not. God's word is truth and we need to stand firm in it. And it's so easy to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine, especially when the teacher who is teaching it makes so much sense or, or they're authoritative in their speech and they, you know, very well loved by, by the community. It's easy to believe what they say on face value, but once again, as I said before, we have to do our own research in these things. We can't take things at face value. So Paul wraps this section up by reminding us that, and them that we're comforted by grace that we've already received from Jesus Christ. So at this time, I'll ask uh, the musicians to come up and lead us in a song of invitation. Um, if you need this grace that Paul talks about here in the end, I'll be happy to, to show it to you and lead you to to God if, if that's what you desire. If you want to pray by yourself, you can come over here and I'll leave you alone. Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling Calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden, and thou shalt be blessed.